Well, bless the Lord. Let's just continue with our teaching today again. We're still dealing with the end of the age. We're still de dealing with the last days. And uh, <clears throat> if ever there was a time in history that God will want for His people to find out what His will is for their lives, which is their destiny, it, it will be now. Because God can only use people that are conscious of their destiny, that are pursuing their destiny to do great exploits for Him. You understand? You know, God doesn't really need us. But God will choose to use us. Sovereignly, God can do anything, anytime He wants to. But because of He's a, he's a God of principle, and He created us with a purpose and destiny, He won't do anything on the earth without us. You understand? Even, even if He wants to do something, the Bible says He will say, first say to His prophets. Why? Because God chose us to be part of His great big plan for humanity and for the world as a whole from the time it was created until the time it will come to an end. You understand? So destiny in this hour, in this time, in this season in the church is very important. So we have to pursue our destiny in these last days. You know, so, so far we, I think we did two sessions on, on destiny, finding your purpose, finding your destiny. And we just look at a few things today. Uh, things that we've already learned. Just to recap, just a few things, so that just to help you along, you must understand this is not a sermon or a, a me message just so that you could be blessed. It is instructive. You understand? It's an instructive message. It's an instruction coming from God's Word. You've got to take this and you've got to work it in your life. All right? There's no magic to these words. These words have purpose. This teaching has purpose. So you have to take it and apply it into your life. So the first thing we learned was that every person on earth has a destiny. Every human being on earth has a destiny. Right now there's almost 8 billion people on earth and every single one of them have a destiny. Everyone have a purpose of God to be here. That's the first thing we've learned. Okay, God never created us without purpose. He created us with purpose. And one of the main purposes is for us to dominate and to manifest His manifold wisdom here on the earth and display it to the heavens. I know that goes a little deep. I don't have time to clarify that, but you can go to the book of Ephesians and read that. He has predestined that for us in Christ. All right? So every human being from the time the human beings were created from the time of Adam, from the time of Noah, every human being on the planet has a destiny and a purpose from God. All right? The next one is that we found out is only those in Jesus Christ, only those in Christ Jesus, you know, will, will, will find out these destiny, what their destiny is. All right, then oh, they're the only ones who will actually come to know what their destiny is. Now, out of Jesus Christ, if you study the philosophy of Solomon, which we did a, a while ago, I don't know if you remember, when we studied the book of Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, and as you know, he was one of the greatest philosophers ever lived. Uh, he used all the wisdom and knowledge and understanding that God gave him to study life in a way no other human being has ever, ever studied life. So if you want to know about life, you want to understand about life, go to Solomon's writing and read there. And there's some of the things that he says is, you know, it's not so easy to understand. I just heard a message um, uh, probably about a week ago from someone. I heard this man preach before. And in that message, he made, uh, you know, so much of sense about something, you know, and I really enjoyed hearing that uh, from him. And I said, okay, let me listen to him again, because now he's talking about... Uh, uh, he was talking about something and then he was, uh, it was all related to Solomon and I said, wow. He was like completely offline. Because he never understood the philosophy of life that Solomon gave. He says the book of Ecclesiastes is a very depressing book. Because he's reading that 
with a different mindset. So when I went to study that, the Holy Spirit said, watch out when you read this and study this, because you've got to follow me. And I followed him very closely. And then he uh, disclosed to me the philo philosophical mindset of Solomon when he was studying life and when he started making note of it. Then I had to use my whatever uh, uh, experience I had in philosophy to go and study that, to get that into my system and fully understand what this man was saying. So even there, uh, Solomon in one section in, in Ecclesiastes, he says that every human being, God has put destiny in every human being. In every human being, God has put eternity. And then he goes on and he continues saying that life is useless, life is worthless, life is like chasing after the wind and there's nothing new under the sun and that, that minister never understood that. You know, he never really understood what this man was saying and out of his study of life, he realized that people are living in, in vanity. Now, who is not living in vanity? The ones who find their purpose in Christ Jesus. Now, out of Jesus, you cannot actually find purpose. All right? Now, let me just tell you this as well at the same time. That not everybody who is in Christ will actually find their destiny as well. Even though they have purpose, even though they have a God-given destiny in them, even though inside of them they have eternity, but not everyone will find it. Why? Because not everyone is looking for it. Not everyone is searching for it. Not everyone is asking God for it. No, not everyone is really you know, interested in it. Why? Because we are stuck in a system. I like to call it a secular system, not necessarily a carnal system. Okay, carnality is against God. All right? Uh, uh, secularism is somewhere in between. So many people are somewhere in between, neither here nor there. That is why sometimes they mix up the principles of God and His Word with a system that they already are so used to. They are bound by the system. So even the understanding of scriptures sometimes comes from a secular mindset. They cannot fully comprehend what the Holy Spirit is saying. So that is why I'm saying to you, not everybody in the body of Christ will actually find their destiny because they're not really interested. You understand? And one reason, as you know, there's a, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that if you are found faithful with little, then God will entrust much to you. Now, your destiny is not just much. Your, your destiny is your sole purpose for existence. It's greater than much. Do you think that God is just going to supernaturally, you know, come and drop destiny upon someone who is not interested and who is not faithful with little? I mean, people are not faithful with little, like as even church attendance. Do you think that person is actually going to find destiny? I mean, they can't even attend to church services. They can't attend to prayer meetings. They can't do little things. How can God entrust them with such a huge thing, a huge thing as destiny? What will they do with it? I'll tell you what might happen to them. That will, will, they'll perish. Because just destiny is not child's play. The demand of destiny, they wouldn't be able to meet it. They wouldn't be able to meet it. Because you are first tried and tested in small things. Then the Bible says God will entrust you with big things. All right. So the next one is the greatest journey in life is God's purpose, right? Which is our destiny. That's the greatest journey. That's the reason why we're here. I mentioned in the last uh, session that the, the study of philosophy is based only on one foundation, on three questions. Where have I come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going? Okay, that question is, is something that everyone who studies life have to ask those questions and they spend the rest of their life finding the answer to it. The person that I studied under, when I did a bit of a study on philosophy, he found Jesus Christ at the age of 59. He was a secular philosopher. But he still, at the age of 59, after so many years, he still couldn't find the purpose of life until one day 
He said, well, these Christians, they, they talk about a lot of things. So, so he took the Bible and he started to read the Bible and it shocked him. Because in the Bible, he found purpose of life. He gave his life to Jesus Christ at the age of 59. So I did studies under him uh, when it came to philosophy. And I tell you what, it was amazing because now here's a secular man who came to the Bible, read the scriptures, found the true purpose of life and destiny of life. And why, where he came from, that's the first question. He found the answer to it. What he's doing here, he found the answer to that. And where he is going from here, he found the answer to that and he was settled. Jesus Christ is Lord and he's Lord of my life. Are you listening? So it is all in him. And then he got saved and then he started to teach now from what he understood and secular studies. And then he came through, start bringing the Bible and start bringing out uh, his understanding about from the Bible regarding philosophy. You understand? So this is the greatest journey. Some people spend their whole lives. Like this man, he spent his whole life, basically, 59 years of age when he gave his life to the Lord. So he spent a lot of time from a young man studying philosophy, trying to answer those three questions, looking at different people's writings, studying other philosophers, what they had to say, and studying religion, too. He studied Hinduism, he studied Islam, he studied a lot of religions because somehow he was looking to answer those questions and then he find, found the answers in the scriptures, in the Bible, gave his heart to the Lord. So it's the greatest journey, and that's the journey I live for. I exist just for that journey. All right? And then the next thing we found out is that when you find it, you find peace. All right? When you find it, you find peace. So what is peace? What is peace? Peace is something that the kingdom of God is made up of. Righteousness, Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That makes up the kingdom of God. Peace is not just a feeling. You understand? You can have peace in... Uh, uh, peace is not the absence of war. <laughs> okay, many people, that's, what, that's, the, that's the definition. When you have peace, then there's no war. Uh-uh. That is not the peace we're talking about. This is the, the peace we're talking about is the, having peace in the midst of war. If you want to talk to somebody that is in war... Talk to me. I've been in this trench now for about 20 plus years. And I'm fighting the good fight of faith every moment of every day I'm at war. Come talk to me and I'll tell you. But I have peace. I have peace. That peace manifests in my life. It manifests in my body. Nobody, I'm telling you right now, my personal testimony. If the peace of God never rule and reign in my life, you would have buried me a long time ago. Because no human being can survive this. I'm telling you right now, if you only understand what I have been through and the type of war I'm up against, every day there's new enemies. People don't know me, hate me. You understand? So I'm at peace with that. Can you be at peace with that? Only because you know destiny, you can be at peace. If you don't know destiny, you can't be at peace. So this is not the peace which is speaking of the absence of war. This is a peace you have in spite of the war. You have this peace because you know where you're going. All right? So you see the answer to that question now. So it's important. Now the next one we found out is the journey is the most treacherous, most life-threatening, most difficult thing you have ever done with your life. When you find destiny... And when you're pursuing it, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's the most treacherous journey. It's the most difficult. It's very, very difficult terrain. To be honest with you, you don't know where you're putting your next foot. You want to take a step forward, but you don't know where it's going to land. I'm not talking about an uncertainty of doubt and fear. I'm talking about how treacherous the journey is, how difficult it can be. So, yes, this, when you find destiny, in other words, God has to make a warrior of you immediately. He's got to completely transform you. Like me, like what he did to me. Now, you all, all of you know my children. If you, when you look at Michelle, my eldest, I am Michelle. 
I don't talk unless people talk to me. I'm an introvert by nature. I'm not the one to strike the first conversation or say the first thing and have the last say. I'm the one if you am spoken to, then I'll speak. If I'm questioned, I'll answer. If not, I'd rather just be quiet. Now, he took an introvert, made a warrior out of him, and I can't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> you know, I talk 24 hours a day. So that's what God has to do. And that's what he will do. And you'll know it because your life is being transformed. All the time you're becoming a different person from the time you were born up until now, you are a totally different person. Somebody met me after so many years of my life. The first thing he told me, hey, you have changed. Because he knew me when I was a teenager. Playing the guitar on the roadside, you know, under the light pole. And all the drunkards used to drink and dance. And I used to stand there and play the guitar. No, I never used to drink or do anything like that. But I used to sing rock, pop songs and, you know, rock songs and play the guitar. And they used to drink and dance. He's, from that time he knew me. He says, me, you changed. I said, the Jesus in me. Now that's what happens now. When you find your destiny, it's very difficult. It's not easy. If someone told you that it's easy, they lied to you. It's very hard. It's very difficult. You've got to fight. And you, you can't be saying to yourself, I wish this thing would stop. No, no, it's continuous. Your wishes won't be granted. So in other words, what you have to be a warrior. You've got to have to keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. All right? So the next one we realize is that you have supernatural joy and energy doing it. You know, it's like last night I was worshipping the Lord and um, I was really straining myself a bit and I felt tired, you know, in, uh, in, in a few hours I felt tired as I was playing this guitar and I was singing a song to the Lord and, uh, and I sang the song in Hindi. You know, uh, I learned the song already, which I'll teach you soon. We're going to have a special day for that. And I, was, I sang the song and I was so lack of energy. You know, it's like I was looking for the bed now. But I continued. I said, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm just going to I'm just going to sing this song to you. And as I did that, I sang the song because I, under, I have the meaning. I know what I was singing. And then I sang the chorus part of the song in Malayalam. Because I understand, I just started learning those languages recently, but the Holy Spirit's helping me. I'm getting supernatural help here. So I sang the chorus part of it in Malayalam, and when it was, how it was originally written. And I was so touched by that, singing it again and again, and sang it in Hindi again, the entire song. And then I, from there, I moved on to another song, which was sung in Telugu. Now, Telugu is not an easy language as well. I sang that entire song playing the guitar, and I just enjoyed myself, and that tiredness was gone. I was so energized, I was so full with the power of God, now I wouldn't want to put the guitar down, now I don't want to stop now. Now this is what I'm talking about, a manifestation of God's glory and of strength in the time when people expect you to fall down and die. You've got energy to continue doing and pursuing your destiny. That's supernatural. You must know this stuff, church. You must know this. It's important for you to know this. All right? The next one is the training. The training is tougher than the purpose. Now, you know, some people, when you go to, like, when they join the Navy or they join the Army, they go to very rigorous training, difficult training. I mean, they are asked to do very difficult things. And then finally, when they graduate and they get positioned, they wonder what all that training was about because they don't need half of it. But they fail to realize that all the training procedures and all what they have done has actually qualified them now to come into this position. And now once they are positioned, the job becomes so much easier. So what makes this job seem to be so easy and so light, you know, and effortlessly you do your, uh, fulfill your responsibility? It was the training. You understand? They do not half train you. They give you the full training. 
Now that's how God does. That's exactly what He does. He puts you through your paces. He allows you to go through valleys. He allows you to, uh, to, to be confronted by enemies. He allows for your life to be threatened. All of these things. But not all one time. Gradually, you start getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You understand? He, he makes you stronger and then we realize at the end of the day when you're actually doing what God wants you to do, that that road you came from is so difficult, was so difficult, you never thought you were actually going to make it. But now you're actually fulfilling your purpose. Then you realize, hang on, things are much easier now. Things are, you know, it's like I'm doing this effortlessly. No, it was the training. Are you listening? Joseph was trained for 13 years to be prime minister. And then when he was as prime minister, he took a few more years, I think seven years or so, by the time he fulfilled his, his destiny. Every single one of those lives that we spoke about, you can go ahead and you can study them. But now we're going to look at one life very quickly. We did look at it before, but I just want to highlight a few things to you about this one man by the name of David. As you already probably picked up right now, he's one of those favorite characters of mine in the Bible. I mean, in Bible college in 1990, I think, <laughs> I spent an entire session, you know, an entire course studying his life. I, 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 I thought his life was fascinating. But when I got deeper and deeper and deeper, you saw that his life was more like a rose bush. When you look at it from far, it's so beautiful. But when you go near only, you realize there's some thorns there. I mean, difficult, really. And, it, and it's dangerous. I mean, so much of thorns. So you never see it from far. That's David's life. That's all of our lives, actually. It looks beautiful. When people look at it, when they sense the anointing, when they see the breakthrough, you know, I got a... I got a call this week from somebody whom the doctors gave a very, very, very bad report for. And then when I went and prayed for him, and he spoke to him this week on the phone, he says to me, Pastor, thank you for coming all the way. You know that day when you laid your hands on me? I was healed already. But I had to go to the doctors. And then went to the doctor. The doctor did an entire checkup again and asked him, how did you get healed so quick? With the kind of a problem you had in your body. You're now healed. How did this happen? I know it wasn't the medication. So you, you, you see this is what's happening. So it's like a rose bush. When people look at it from far, they say, wow, God's using that man. God used him to heal this person. God used him. That's a rose bush. Come closer. Then you'll see the thorns, the difficulties, the fighting, the war that's going on. That's exactly what happened to David. All right, that's exactly what happened to him. Let's understand here, yeah? David was about, what, they, they say the estimate was between, estimation was about between 14 or 15 years of age. I would think maybe around 17, I would think. All right, at this time. Uh, this verse of scripture says, so as David stood there among his, among his brothers, must not this was now the prophet Samuel came to David's house. Must understand Samuel. <laughs> Samuel was a prophet of God, but when Samuel comes, it's like uh, it's the biggest celebrity and the biggest president in the world. Everything comes to a standstill when Samuel comes to your house. Are you listening? Samuel was a prophet of God. Must understand he was bigger than any president you can think of. So he, when God told him, go to the house of Jesse, he was not sending a small prophet. He was sending a man whose status was so huge. So the whole town, the whole city probably came to a standstill because Samuel was coming to town today. And I can imagine the people on the roadside and everywhere waiting to, to see him. And, but he came to the house of Jesse. And uh, I think his entourage together with him, they probably made up a very big group. And, he, and I don't think he immediately entered the house or whatever. I don't know what, what the protocol is, but they, something of that nature. But you know what he said to Jesse? He says, God sent me here to anoint one of your sons as king, as future king of this country. 
How many sons you got? Call them. So each one came. Seven of them came. And each one came. And Samuel said, it might be, must be this one. God said, no, must be this one. No, must be this one. Seven of them went past and God said, no. He said, Jesse, have you got another son? Yes. Ah, but he's small. He's nothing, you know. He's just a little boy. We just got him out there looking after the sheep. Samuel said, I'm not going to even sit down until you bring that boy here to me. And as soon as David came in front of Samuel, God says, yes, here's the king. He was the youngest of eight brothers. Samuel took the horn of oil, got ready now. So as David stood there among his brothers, can you imagine the jealousy of the brothers? Well, if you study, you'll find out how jealous the brothers have got. So as David stood, you know, the whole family thought nothing of him because he was the youngest, the eighth boy. You understand? He was just good enough to look after sheep. The whole family thought. Even Jesse said the same thing, his father. But as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought he had brought and anointed David with the oil and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. Came fulfilled what God asked him to do and he went. I don't think this was very much of a surprise to David. But it was very much a surprise to his entire family. But to David I don't think so because I think David... While he was looking after the sheep, he was actually looking after his spiritual life also. David was a musician. David was a worshipper by nature. David created 4,000 instruments. 4,000. And he played every one of it as worship to God. You understand? So he had something very strong in his life. And that is why I pushed you so hard this morning and I keep pushing you to worship. Because you can't find your destiny without worship. And it was so easy for this young man. And that's what happened to him. Now, <clears throat> what happened, that was now the prep, preparation. That's starting. Okay, the preparation now for what's going to happen to his life later for him to actually be uh, positioned. All right, there's a preparation. Now, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 3. So now this is now many years later, like about almost 15 years later. Okay, so there at Hebron, King David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel and they anointed him king over Israel. You must understand he already was anointed 15 years ago or so, all right, by, this, by, prophet, uh, by prophet Samuel. Now the people said to him, they had no king, and they said to him, you know, even though the old king was still alive, but, you know, you are the one who led the army to battle. You're the one who brought victory. You're the one who, you know, did this and you're the one who did that. So, so what they did was, they said to him, it's about time now, I think you took your position. The, all of the people of Israel told him. So they at Hebron, they anointed him. Obviously, the prophet came again. And this, that anointing was preparation. All right. Introductory anointing, the first one being, being like uh, set apart. That's what God does. If God, as, if, when, you find, when you're seeking your destiny, the first thing God will introduce you to is an anointing. You understand? So a person who receives the anointing comes alive. Because God, God cannot re reveal a destiny to a dead, spiritually dead person. To a spiritual uh, junkie. Or a religious person. He has to have somebody. Though the first thing he does, he introduces the anointing. So that person knows the anointing. Then there comes time now for the positioning. Alright? So God positioned him now that day as king. Now, between from that time when he was first anointed as king, when he first got the anointing, the Bible says now the Spirit of God came upon him from that day forever. Right? From that day till today, it was about 15 years. Now, there's a lot of things happened in that 15 years. There's a lot of things that happened to David in that 15 years. 
David's life was threatened so many times. The same king, Saul, that was king, current king of Israel, hated him, sent out his army to go and capture him. David never lived a comfortable life. But it was all in training. Because he became the greatest king that Israel ever had. Because, listen to me, no other king of Israel went through all that training like David did. But becoming the king of Israel wasn't his destiny. Oh, then what was his destiny? I'll shock you with that just now. But right now, being positioned as a king wasn't his destiny. And why he was the greatest king? Because of the journey. You wouldn't believe what David went through. But we're going to read this one account here. And you know the story very well. All right? And you know the story of, uh, of Goliath, right? Now, why, the reason why we can use that story more than any other part of his life is because it's so much more clear here in this particular story what David understood about that anointing. You must know he's not anointed as king as yet. He's not positioned. He's still that little shepherd boy. Right? So his, his, uh, his, his father called him from the field. And the Bible says that he left the sheep, what he was taking care of, with another, sh with another shepherd. And then uh, his father called him. He went to his father. His father said, see, your brothers are fighting in the war there. Please take this food for them. Take this bread, take this cheese, take all of these things here uh, to them. And take this other basket as well and give this to the captain. All right? So David went. He was obedient to his father. See, that is one of the things that, uh, that you must understand. A person of destiny, a person who is pursuing destiny, is quite an obedient person. You know why? Because they don't have any selfish ambition anymore. Every ministry you know of that went through difficulties, it, the, the difficulties that came to that ministry was with people who had a selfish ambition. And they call that calling. It's not a calling. It's just a selfish ambition. They have their own ambition about the church, about the pastor, about a vision. They don't have a vision. They're just hungry for position and limelight. Are you listening? But a person of destiny, a person who knows that he or she is pursuing destiny, they're very easygoing, very obedient. They know what is of God. And they know how to serve. You understand? So here you are. He's a servant. Now he's still a little boy. He took the food and he went over. While he was there, he heard this huge commotion. You know? And then he heard some screaming coming down from the valley. And, he's, and he heard the screaming. So he ran to listen to what the man was saying. This is brand new to him, you understand? His brothers were used to it because that Goliath, that giant, has been doing that for 40 days. He has been doing that for 40 days. So they, they were quite used to it. But every time he came out and he screamed at them and they called them out for a fight, they ran and they hid. But this young man went to the front, heard what he is saying, and he asked a question. He said, he asked everybody there, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, hear the term. Hear the term. The term is important here. See, this is what I am saying. I speak to many people in my life, even people in ministry, even pastors. The way they term things that comes out of their mouth speaks to me. You see, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an analyst by nature. And I will know the depth of somebody by the way they speak. And I can tell you some pastors are very, very shallow. I wonder the state of their sheep. Oh, really? Because most of the things they talk about is coming from a secular mindset. Hardly spiritual. So I'm saying this to you right now. The term is important. Well, I don't know what the others were saying. But this is what David said. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He never said, who is this Philistine? Who is this giant? Who is this Goliath? No. Who is this uncircumcised? What is he saying here? He's saying that guy's got no covenant with God. That is what he is saying. I have a covenant. He doesn't. How dare? How dare him defy the armies of the living God? We are in covenant. 
Who on earth is this guy? You know, anger rose up on the inside of him. Let me tell you another thing about a person of destiny. You know, naturally, you don't have to be confrontational. All you need to be is a person of destiny and automatically you will confront certain things. Automatically you will confront certain things. Now, I'm, I'm personally, I'm not confrontational. You can do the worst thing to me. You might not even hear from me. Even when I get to know it, you will not get a call, you won't get a visit, whatever. Because I'm not confrontational by nature. But there are two, two men of God that preachers, you know, on television, whatever. I confronted them in the past two weeks about something that they have said that is contrary to Scripture. And that's contrary. And one man spoke very bad about India. Oh, you don't speak, speak bad about India to me. Because I have more knowledge about that country, I think, more than the Indians that are living there. You understand? So I, 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 was, I confronted him. He, he, he tried to, uh, you know, he tried to, you know, uh, come around the circle. I said, no, you don't. I said, your points. Your points are incorrect. So I'm not confrontational, as I said. But because it has to do with the kingdom, and I'm destiny conscious, you don't talk against anything that I have become conscious of. A destiny, person of destiny, that's how they behave. David knew his destiny. He, knew he was, he was uh, in covenant with God. Whole of Israel was. But, but he said, hang on. How dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? Listen carefully. Others didn't say that. David said it. There was a reason for him to say it. You see, as I'm saying again, church, training. A lot of people don't like training. Even people in ministry, people that, that you train, they get upset with you. Who he thinks is God. Let me tell you something. Your, your training will determine where you go how far you go. You understand? I, I know personally people, I can write their names and give it to you if you want, which I wouldn't do, but I'm just saying, have personally aborted their destiny. They have. Because they thought they can fulfill this thing on their own. You cannot. God has to train you. He has to use somebody. He has to put you in the ditch for you to know what it feels like. He has to put you in the pit. He has to put you in dangerous situations. For you to fight your way around. He's not going to put you in a cocoon somewhere. In a glass box somewhere. He's going to put you out there where the enemy is. And where the enemy is doing dirt. And killing people. You have to survive that. Are you listening? So when this boy. When he got anointed with the anointing. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord was upon him from that day forward. I believe his worship went higher. Greater. I believe that's when he created all of these instruments. This is when he started worshipping God. This is where now his destiny became more and more clear because he came to know why that prophet Samuel came and poured the oil on him. And now he's out there still in the wilderness. You understand? He never goes and be king immediately like some Christians will do today. No, he went back, still taking care of the sheep. After getting the anointing, after the Holy Spirit come upon him, he went back still taking care of the sheep. But he was learning things now. He became focused, very focused. He started understanding things he never understood before. Now, he's in a situation here where there is an enemy who has no covenant with God, but he is defying the armies of the living God with threats. Two times, three times a day, he's doing that for 40, uh, for 40 days. And here comes a little young man, destiny conscious, know who he is, fighting the war out there alone and in the wilderness. And then he says, I'm going to go get this guy. The guy said, no, you can't. You can't. He said, no, I'm going to go get this guy. I, uh, I'm in covenant. He's defying, defy, uh, defying the armies of the living God. I'm going to get him. They said, no, you cannot do that. David, you're still a young man. You don't have any experience. That's what the world will tell you. They don't know the experience you have. They don't just, some people don't just look at you and say, ah, they judge you by, the, by how you look, how you dress, 
what you drive, where you live, you know, like that. That's secular. They don't know who you are really on the inside. Are you listening? A person of destiny will go through so much of pain in his or her life that you inflict another pain, they won't even twitch. Because the threshold for pain has gone much higher. While others will sit and cry like crybabies, they'll just walk through. Doesn't affect them. They don't get intimidated. They've come a long way already. This man is still a young man. So when they, when they heard about this, they took him to the king. They took him to Saul. And Saul said, okay, who are you? You know, he says, well, uh, uh, I'm your servant, David. I'm the son of your servant, Jesse. Oh, he says, I'm going to go get this guy, king. He says, no, you can't. He says, you can't go get him. Because, this is what he's saying here. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied to David. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. <laughs> That's what you think. That's what you think, King. You don't know where I'm coming from. You're looking at me as a young man standing here in front of you. You don't know me. You don't know my mindset. You don't know where I'm coming from. You don't know what God taught me. You don't know the situations he put me through. You're intimidated. I'm not. All right? Listen to what he's saying. You are only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. He says, so am I. I too have been a man of war. Well, not in the open. Not where everybody can see me and give me crowns and give me accolades and give me good words. No, no, no. I also am a man of war in places where no one can see. You see, this is destiny. This is destiny. You will be trained where no one can see. So when you come to them, they don't know where you're coming from. They'll judge you by the natural. And only when you, they see your strength, then realize, hey, hang on, this person is not as weak as we think he is or she is. Obviously, they're coming a long journey down this road. That's exactly her. David was a warrior from his youth as well. But he wasn't doing it for show, you see. He wasn't an army. He wasn't being trained by officials. He, wasn't be, he was being trained by God. He had the anointing upon his life. He, had a, he was conscious of the covenant he had with God. He was carrying the presence of God in him wherever he went. So yes, Goliath was a man of war since youth. So, do I, so am I. You don't know me. But he didn't say that. But this is how he replied. Verse 34. But David persisted. I have been taking care. This is how he explained himself. See the humility here. See the humility. This is a heart of a true destiny conscious, conscious individual. Conscious of his destiny. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. You see, one of the things he didn't do, he didn't shy away from trouble. Because a destiny conscious person don't do that. They don't run and hide. Everybody else will. The destiny conscious person will go direct to the devil, to his face. Are you listening? The rest of them will run and hide. But you see, he could have went away and said, ah, the king said, I can't go. He could have went back to his brothers and, you know, and all the other people who said that he's, he, he's too young. And they'll say, yeah, we told you so. We told you so that you're too young, you can't go, the king won't let you go. But he didn't do that. Are you listening? He didn't do that. But David persisted. He didn't move. He says, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, he did not talk about one lion and one bear now, all right? He had that, uh, that kind of a uh, experienced many times, not just one time. It wasn't one lion and one bear. They were always coming. You're getting the picture. So don't listen to preachers that tell you that David killed a bear and he killed a lion. David was always being confronted with lions and bears. That's what he's saying here. All right? Verse 35. 
I go after it, he says. When they come and take a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Can you believe that? He is giving the king a vivid description of how he fights. See, a destiny conscious person fights differently. He don't need an army behind him. He don't need a big crowd around him cheering him on. No, no, because he's training to place in a quiet place. Nobody knows. Nobody sees, saw him clubbing that lion to death or clubbing that bear to death. Nobody saw it. He never put it in the tribune, you know, he never put it in the paper, in the tabloid. He never, no, he had all the training there. He did what he had to do there. And he's saying to the king, he's saying to the king, this is what he did. Verse 36. I have done this to both, see the plural there? I have done this to both lions and bears. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine. Two. For he has defied the armies of the living God. Can you see now? See, see there's something about a person of destiny. They don't fight battles for themselves. Oh, I really need to go and see that person, eh? because that's what he said about me. I need to go and talk to that person, because that's what they gossiped about me. A destiny conscious person, don't worry about it. When they fight a war, it has to be for the kingdom. So I'm telling you right now, all the wars I fight is for the living God. You can do what you want. You can say what you want. You can be the worst enemy I've ever had in my life. I will never confront you, come to you, talk to you, ask you to stop even. Because my war is not based on that level. It's shocking how Christians live on that level. You're trying to be at peace with everybody. God is not asking you to be at peace with everybody. God is asking you to be at peace with Him. Then you'll have destiny on your mind. Then you'll pursue your destiny. And you'll have peace with God. But you'll have tons of enemies. You'll have people that will set entrapment for you. You'll have people that will spread rumors about you. You'll have people that will put you on social media. You'll have people who will say things about you. And the worst thing of all, everybody who reads that will believe that about you. So how do you, how do you vindicate yourself? You can't. So you leave it to God. God vindicates you at the end of the day. Are you listening? So when you live on this level, you don't come there personally to take it on personally. David never had a personal agenda. He never come there with a personal agenda and say, I'm going to kill this Goliath because I hate him. No, no. Not a personal agenda. I'm going to kill this guy like I killed the lions and the bears because he's defying the armies of the living God. Kingdom war. Are you listening? Kingdom war. Verse 37. The Lord... <laughs> Listen to this here. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. King, I got experience of being rescued. All of those guys you got outside there, all trained army officials and, 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 and soldiers out there, uh -uh. they are not trained. They don't have experience of being rescued. I got experience, King, of being rescued. Saul finally consented. I mean, you know, to get Saul to actually consent. Saul was a hard man. So Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. So David took that word. But you know what they did after that? They tried to condition him. They put, took Saul's uh, army um, um, and uh, all the, those gears they put there for defensive uh, and for uh, protection. All his defensive gears and protection gears, they took it and put it on David. They say, what's this? No, 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 no. I have not proved this. I never used this in my life. I can't move. These things are heavy. This, no, no, I don't need this. I never had this when I fought the lion. I never had this when I fought the bear. The God who rescued me from the claws of the lion and bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And he took the whole thing off, left it down, and he ran. And ran. And ran to the book, brook called Kidron, picked up five smooth stones and continued running. I believe he ran down 
From that brook, he ran down the valley, down that mountain, into the valley. He never stopped running. But when he came down, the Philistines started to breathe threats against him and told him this and told him that. And David never stayed quiet. He opened his mouth. He says, uh-uh. The birds of the air is going to eat your flesh today. It's going to eat Philistine meat today. I'm going, I, I'm going to take you down. I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to chop off your neck. This is what David is saying to this giant. And this was a very big man, you know. Nine feet. Almost nine feet is almost three meters a night. So that's a tall person. He won't come through that door there. And here's a little young man, small boy, you know. Don't know what's his age right now. But never stopped running. And this is what a person of destiny does. He never stops running in spite of the stumblings, in spite of objections, in spite of uh, um, uh, obstacles, in spite of what people are saying, in spite of social media. In, no, no, no. He keeps running because he's got to get this Goliath down today. And he kept on running. And then while he was running, I believe, he took, he probably dropped his stuff. He took his stone, his little smooth stone, put it in, in his sling, kept on running. Ran and ran and ran until he was close enough and he let that stone go. And he hit this guy right on his forehead and he fell. That stone didn't kill him. The stone stunned him. David killed him with his hands. David went and took his own sword. David never had a sword. Took his own sword, raised it up above his head and took his head of him chopped off his head that's a person of destiny you know by the time David became king David was so I mean <laughs> David was a cool king really he, everything just went well for him David was never threatened by threats from other countries if they want to have a war with him fine you want to fight no problem I've come this way before you understand? So, he, so everything became so much more easier. He never had to fight the way he fought up until that point of becoming king. But if becoming king, if becoming king wasn't his destiny, then what was his destiny? You want to know? To produce a bloodline through which the saviour of the world will be delivered. Mary, Joseph, they were in the bloodline of David. And God made this promise to David before David died. He says, this kingdom, David, shall never be taken away from you. This kingdom shall be established forever. Not the kingdom of Israel where he was king at that time. No, 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 no. When you go to the book of Isaiah, you see Isaiah is saying the same thing about Jesus now. This kingdom shall never come to an end. God said the same thing to David. You understand? So God, so sorry, David's destiny was to produce a bloodline that will produce, that will, that will deliver, that will give birth to the Son of God upon the earth. You're talking about greatness. You're talking about destiny. Man, can you believe that? So what was all this hardship for? It was for that. It was to produce a type of a bloodline that God wanted. You know, when the first time when God spoke to Samuel, God told Samuel, I want you to take your own of oil or your flask of oil. I want you to go to the household of Jesse. For me, I have found me a man after my heart. That was introduction to Samuel. That's what God said to Samuel. Not I found one big odd shot. He just came out of university. Or she just did this and she just accomplished that. And No, no. Go to the house of Jesse. Take your oil with you. For I have found me a man. After my own heart. That was God's introduction to Samuel about this little teenager, David, who was about 14 or 15 years of age. Can you believe that? And today, hmm, we serve a king, the king of kings, 
the Lord of Lords, who came down through the same bloodline as David. Thank you, Jesus.